Hello everyone. Welcome to this uh, talk at the Cambridge Insights on Demand event. Uh, I'm really pleased that you could join us today. Today what I'm going to talk about is what research tells us about how to improve learner autonomy. Uh, my name is Ben Knight. I'm the director for language research at Cambridge University Press. OK. So first of all, let's start by just clarifying what we mean by learner autonomy. Uh, I think this term was uh, first coined by Henri Olek in 19, 1981. Um, he, he said that the autonomous learner was one who has the ability to take charge of their learning. So it's about taking control, taking responsibility for your own learning as a learner. Um, and we know that in these times of lockdown, of studying, learning from home, remote learning, uh, it's been highlighted the absolute importance of students being able to manage and to take control of their own learning. I've put a few other terms here, which I would say are very much in the same area. Um, sometimes they have a slightly different meaning, but they're really talking about similar things. So independent learning, I think is very similar to learner autonomy, self-directed learning, self-regulated learning. They have specific meanings, but they're in the same kind of area. And these are about encouraging self-regulation, metacognition. I'll talk about a little bit more, but metacognition is thinking about our thinking, thinking about our learning, how we learn. Um, and then learning to learn is kind of that process of developing those skills. They're really all all in the same area. So if you're interested in learner autonomy and you're thinking about all these other areas, you're really interested in the same thing. OK, now those are kind of definition. That's a definition, but really uh, I think it only comes to life when you think about what does a learner autonomy classroom look like? What does a classroom look like where it is uh, where it is strong in developing uh, learner autonomy? Um, so I've kind of uh, pulled out what are the key characteristics that you'd expect to find. You'd find you'd expect that the teacher is giving control to their students in different ways to different degrees. Uh, you'd expect the lesson to be class to be much more learner centered to, to be about what the learners are doing, what they need and not just about a curriculum, not just about going through the materials. You'd expect there to be a lot of self reflection, metacognition, thinking about their learning. You'd expect there to be talk about strategies, how they how they learn about behaviors, techniques, routines, etc. You'd expect there to be quite a lot of self assessment going on. And you'd expect the teacher to be building a kind of community of learning in the classroom. Um, the teacher's probably going to be spending quite a bit of time thinking about how to engage students so the motivation to learn. In a in a um, autonomous learning classroom, there's often a lot of work goes into tracking and monitoring progress because people are on different pathways. And sometimes the teaching style becomes much more uh, closer to coaching than to instructing. So uh, I just listed those. Let me just go back in case uh, anybody wanted to see that full list. That's the full list. Uh, and these are just kind of typical characteristics of a, a classroom. With where learner autonomy is strong. And why is it important? Uh, I think if you're attending this, you probably already have an understanding, but it's worth reminding ourselves that um, that one of the things the benefits of learner autonomy is that it enables the class to the learning, the lessons to be more relevant to each student. If they're taking control, if they're making choices, they're making sure that it's relevant to their particular needs and interests. Um, a second reason is that all, all of us when we're teaching have mixed abilities, some much more than others, but wherever there are mixed abilities, if students are able to take control and charge of their own learning needs, then they're more likely to be met than if you're trying to direct everything from the front as a teacher. Um, a third reason is that uh, we simply know from measures of how long it takes to learn, how many hours are needed, that classroom hours alone that most students are on are not enough to get to where they need to be. So most curricula require students to move at a faster pace than simple, simply the classroom hours allow. So they have to be studying outside the classroom and they have to therefore have the ability and the skills to study effectively on their own. 
And then uh, the fourth reason is that uh, it, it motivates people. They're more engaged learners if they have some control over their learning. OK, um, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about is based on what we've found through the research and there is hundreds or thousands of, of um, research projects that have happened in, in the last 30 years looking at this question of developing learner autonomy, independent learners, etc. Um, and really what we're doing in this talk is kind of extracting from those key points that you would take. So I, I've got a whole list of references which I'm going to give at the end um, and uh, I've just got a few examples here just to kind of give you a sense of this. Uh, Glogger uh, et al. 2012, uh, they looked at using learned, learning journals where, where the students would, at the same time as learning, were writing, keeping a journal of how their learning was going. Uh, and they looked at the types of strategies and the types of thinking about their learning and how that correlated to learning outcomes. Um, and found that th those who were thinking more about their learning strategies were more successful at the end. Um, the embedding st strategy prompts into materials by Michalski 2013 is an example of uh, trying out what happens when you embed in your learning materials prompts for students to reflect on how they are learning um, and again found that these were very effective. Uh, Kistner 2012 10 uh, looked at the comparison between ex explicit and implicit teaching of strategies of learning strategies uh, explicit being where they talk about what they what they need to do and implicit being where the teacher uh, simply models those or gives examples of good behaviors or, or, or strategies but doesn't talk about them explicitly and again found that explicit teaching uh, was more effective than that implicit approach and dialogic teaching uh, from Alexander 2015 is an example of investigating how teachers can use a dialogic approach of questioning uh, the students about what they're doing and how they're approaching the learning task in order to raise their awareness and their effectiveness as learners. Now, uh, so if we if we think back that a lot of this is about uh, the transfer of control from the teacher to the students um, and there are a number of things to think about about managing that transfer uh, effectively so it's not just dropping the students into a situation where they have to take control um, although that is what has happened in many situations in um, in the lockdown but ideally we would be managing that transfer and there are a number of techniques for managing that that have been shown to be effective um, so one of those is scaffolding and you all know scaffolding it's about breaking a task into stages into steps so that they're more manageable about checking the understanding of, of the instructions of what the task is before you move on uh, and frequently checking how their progress is so that's kind of scaffolding structure is where uh, you build up routines for the way things are done uh, so when you're doing a, a reading task for example you may start by checking the uh, certain vocabulary or pre looking at picking out keywords which are difficult um, and the more uh, the more you kind of have a routine for doing something the easier it is for students to feel in control and to take control uh, of their role in that routine flexibility is really about um, making sure that the that the, the activities you have allow for people on different rates of learning, different pathways. So keeping things open ended where possible, uh, tasks which are open ended allow for people who are moving at a faster rate to include stretch options, so additional things like um, if they're doing a reading, to re uh, a speaking activity that students who finish early or are more confident can record themselves and play it back or something like that and then changing groupings is another way of doing this so sometimes you put strong students with strong students sometimes you make strong and weak and that kind of flexibility uh, helps that building up of uh, control among the students and, and the fourth point i wanted to mention was visible monitoring and this is very much about tracking progress um, so that students can see their progress they can see where they're struggling or where they're uh, fine um, and this is often about keeping log books or portfolios different ways of, of visible monitoring so what are the learning behaviors that we want our students to develop to become 
independent autonomous learners. Well, we tend to think of three main areas uh, of learning behaviours. First of all, is planning and goal setting, understanding what they're trying to do. Then there's the managing the learning, the kind of day to day organisation of your learning. And then the third one is self-reflection, that thinking about how your learning is going. Is it successful? What is working? What's not working? And we can look at those in a bit more detail, planning and goal setting being uh, being clear about what you want to achieve, both in the short term, like now, and uh, in the long term, what, what are you really trying to, what's really important for you? Um, and then also just having a plan for learning um, is, is uh, is part of that planning and goal setting. Um, then there is managing your learning, and this is often about kind of making use of resources, tools, techniques, developing effective learning habits, and creating a, a, a learning environment which works for you. And also learning how to manage your motivation levels, what to do when you just don't feel like uh, a certain type of study. And then that self-reflection is tracking and evaluating your own success, in learning a language, but also identifying as a learner and identifying how to improve the success in language learning. So working out, well, you know, I, I do much better when I approach it in this way, for example. OK, so um, I'm going into a bit more detail on each of these. So planning and goal setting. Um, as I said, there's, there's a kind of a longer term view of this, uh, which uh, affects your motivation to keep on learning, to take the course or to, to to be successful in the course. And that might be to do with an exam that you want to pass. It may be that you're thinking of a career where you need English. A another approach is um, about identity. And uh, this is where um, psychologists will talk about the L2 self. Applied linguists will talk about this. So this is a um, how you imagine yourself as a successful learner of the language, user of that second language. Um, and people who, it's a bit like sports, um, imagining yourself successful is the same with language learning. If you can imagine yourself successful and the more detail you can put in that imagination, uh, it affects the, your long-term um, motivation. But then there's also just having a plan to study English. And, and this can be as simple as having a schedule for study. I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to spend uh, 15 minutes every day doing X and that uh, relates to intermediary goals. Maybe your intermediary goal is something like um, I, I want to learn 30 new words each week, or 20 new words, or I'm going to spend 30 minutes uh, listening to a podcast in English every week or something like that. And then being clear about the objective in your immediate study task. So when you're doing a particular task, well, what's the point of this? Why, what, why am I doing this? What's, what am I going to learn from doing this? OK, so then the second area that I was talking about was of learning behaviours is managing your learning. Um, and we talk about six areas here. Obtaining and using learning resources. So it might be, for example, using a personalizable vocab app. Um, it might be finding suitable stories in English, books or films that you can use to improve your English. There's also about developing effective learning habits, so estab establishing those learning routines. It's tracking and rewarding positive habits, so when you do manage to spend that 30 minutes uh, on your vocabulary, well, rewarding yourself. Using tools and techniques for learning. Um, so there are various techniques. One of the techniques which is well known to be effective is testing yourself on exercises from past lessons. Um, or recording yourself on a spoken task and playing that back and listening to it. Um, next area is motivational management. So being aware of your moods and triggers. So what makes you feel unmotivated to learn and what makes what motivates you? That self-awareness. Uh, is critical and then working out what strategies help you to stay engaged when you don't feel like it. Then making use of sources of help um, that might be an online dictionary for example or it might be finding other people to talk to in English and then creating an effective environment for learning um, so creating a space to study English easily and switching off all distractions. Yes those mobile phones do actually switch off um, so 
these are the kind of managing learning techniques and um, approaches, habits that you are trying to develop in your students. The third area which I mentioned was self-reflection and this there are a number of elements to this. Uh, one is identifying what success for a task should be. So if you're going to do um, a presentation, well, what, 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 do you, what do you want that to be like? How do you want it to sound? Uh, just understanding what you're aiming for. And then as a learner being able to evaluate your success, you know, did you do it well? Did you, did you feel you did it well? What do you think you could have done better? Well, that strays into the third point, which is identifying how to improve learning behaviours. As I said before, if you find that actually I do much better when I prepare um, a speaking task by making brief notes, for example. And then identifying what improves your motivation to complete learning tasks is another uh, aspect of self-reflection, much more on your motivation than your actual learning techniques. OK, then, uh, as I mentioned, one of the key aspects of uh, an autonomous learning is their ability to assess themselves. And and one of the stages towards being assessed yourself is learning to assess your peers. That's part of the same process. Um, and there are a number of things that we know make that more successful, that self-assessment. I've picked out four here which are um, useful. Uh, ways of approaching self-assessment. First of all, that uh, students, when you ask them self-assess, you should always ask them to focus on just one or two things. It, otherwise, there's a cognitive overload for them. Um, uh, for example, if there's a speaking in show and tell and you're asking the other students to listen and comment on each student, um, you might say, ask them to focus on one thing. Are they loud and clear enough? Or is there not too much hesitating. So just one or two things to focus on. Secondly, uh, to balance encouragement and correction, because if we feel if we only get correction, we feel we're no good at doing something. And that uh, belief in ourselves, uh, which we call self-efficacy, the belief that we can do something is critical to staying engaged with the learning process. So, for example, if you're asking peer assessment, you can ask them or even self-assessment always to make one positive comment as well as one correction or improvement. Then giving the students phrases for feedback. Uh, for example, you know, it was good when you, you should try to, you shouldn't say. These phrases just help them to, to actually develop the habit of giving feedback and evaluating. And then finally, if you can give criteria and a lot of people uh, will produce these, you might find it from Cambridge exams, handbooks, etc. cetera. Um, this one came from uh, yeah, a site called Twinkle. Um, they produce these kind of grids, which are really useful, uh, really helpful uh, for you. And you can give to students and it helps them think about self-assessing their writing, what's really important for their writing. Now, a, another really important dimension to learner, learner autonomy is the social one. Now, we tend to think of learner autonomy as individuals working on their own. Um, but in reality, it's about uh, moving away from the teacher directedness of learning. And collaborative learning, learning in groups, learning with peers is part of that moving away from the uh, control of the teacher. And uh, it's really important to develop a collaborative um, approach within your classroom so that you can build up learner autonomy. Uh, and there are a number of features which are really important for collaborative learning. First of all, it gives a lot of useful interaction uh, that when students are practicing and they're giving feedback, it's not when they're doing a task or activity, it's not just silent rehearsal. They're actually practicing their speaking and giving feedback. Um, it also gives an opportunity for peers to teach and coach each other. Um, uh, it, it's also a way that, as I mentioned at the beginning, of developing student re responsibility for their learning, not just um, the, not just the teacher directing it. Uh, and then finally, it, it reduces anxiety and it builds a sense of uh, security and confidence among students so that they feel more encouraged and stronger to to manage their own learning. 
So um, one of the last areas I want to look at is the, is the one of motivation and engagement. And this is a key element because uh, learner autonomy is not just about the skill, it's also the will uh, so that students need to want to manage their own learning, to, to take charge of their own learning. So let's think a little bit about that. And um, one thing that's worth uh, referring to now is uh, the growth mindset approach, which uh, has which was developed by Carol Dweck. Uh, I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with this. Um, and what uh, Dweck was really highlighting was that there is a contrast in approaches and mindsets uh, to learning um, and it's not black and white but the, on the one hand you can see students and learners who are much more towards the fixed approach mindset um, where they think of their ability to learn as something fixed um, and so they avoid challenges they give up easily um, they are they find criticism threatening, etc. And then you have students whose mindset is that they are growing, that they will be able to learn, uh, even if it's going to take them longer than some other people. Um, and so they embrace the challenge, they see effort as necessary, they learn from criticism, etc. And that we know as teachers that it is the growth mindset which is more effective for learning. So what can we do to help learners develop that growth mindset? Um, and there are a number of things that teachers and parents can do. They can praise the learning and not the student's intelligence or their effort. And um, they can use the yet more often with can't. So you, you're not able to do this yet, emphasizing the fact that they will be able to they can use different approaches, um, different approaches to how they learn and to what they learn. Uh, they can encourage collaborative learning. They can test only when learners are ready. They can provide sufficient guided and scaffolded practice again, making sure they don't overwhelm the students. Avoid scores where possible. Uh, for a lot of us work in situations where scores are required or mandated, but where we can avoid it, we should, because it works against um, a, a growth mindset. And doing things like a nice little idea is creating success folders or portfolios uh, that your students do. So uh, motivating students for autonomous learning. Um, there are there are th kind of three areas that you might think about. There are many dimensions to motivating, engaging learners, but there are three um, that I think are particularly useful to think about. Um, the first is the idea, well, there's the accomplishment, curiosity and fun. These are all kind of factors that affect our students engagement in learning. Uh, and when we think about accomplishment, it's that sense that we want to complete something. We want to accomplish something and that motivates us and it's behind a lot of games and um, gamification is that sense of uh, we just want to accomplish it. Um, and we can use things like target numbers. Sorry, let me take that back. Target numbers or setting time limits or competition. And that's what I was just going to give an example here of um, tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. If you've got it, if you're going through a, a, an activity, a task where there are lots of questions and answers and you're checking the answers with a class, divide them into groups, two groups, and um, give them ter take turns to answer the question. If they get the question right, then they're allowed to put their X or their naught uh, in the grid. Uh, and, in that, and if they get it wrong, they can't. And so they fall behind. So it, it adds a, a game competitive element to the to the what is quite a routine activity. Curiosity um, using is we are hardwired to want to resolve things which we don't quite understand or we don't know the answer to. So that drives us, that engages us to keep on going. So cliffhangers to stories, they don't need to hear the end of the story until the next day or the next lesson. Puzzles, uh, a nice little example here which uh, I saw a teacher put together. Um, this is just anagrams of the answers for vocabulary and um, there's just a f it's kind of fun, but wanting to resolve it, wanting to know what the answers are engages the students. Fun um, and you know we know that things which have got visual impact, things which have got music, things which have got humour, these are all things that engage our students. Uh, one thing which you're probably familiar with, lyricstraining.com uh, I think or .org, um, where, they, where, where they play popular music with the lyrics with gaps in it and you have to fill in the gaps but it allows you to adjust the difficulty of 
of the gap fill uh, and is great fun and very popular with students. But it's engaging because of that musical element the, the, and, and um, also that kind of curiosity, wanting to resolve it, wanting to know what the lyrics are. OK, so uh, I've, this has been fairly fast uh, tour through this. We've been looking at what are the aspects of learning autonomy that we can find really from a mixture of looking at the research, but also looking at the experience of um, teachers that have a lot of expertise in this area. And um, we have pulled out a number of factors. So first of all, we've talked about the need to build up to giving control because it's about giving control to the learners, but we can't do that in one way. We have to work out how to build that up. It's about monitoring and tracking progress. And we talked about um, uh, logbooks and portfolios that one of the things we're trying to do is to, to develop their planning skills, their goals and their scheduling and planning, organizing, then learning, developing their learning management skills and their strategies for learning. And then developing their ability to self reflect, to self evaluate both their, both their language and their learning strategies. That we talked about the importance of building up that community of learning so that they are working together and reducing their reliance on the teacher directing them. And finally, building up that self efficacy, that sense of you can do it, I can do it as a learner, uh, the self belief, which is critical to in, to maintaining engagement and motivation. OK, thank you very much. I, that's all I was going to talk to you about uh, for today. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for engaging. Uh, I hope you've been asking uh, lots of questions or making comments and we'll try to respond to your questions and comments um, as far as we can. Um, I, I've also added in the description box a link to a document with uh, a lot of the references to research, which uh, some, some of which I've referred to, but some is just behind uh, a lot of the points I've been making. Um, and so if you want to read more about that research, just check the link and uh, try and find as many of these um, references as you can. Uh, thank you again for your time and uh, I look forward to engaging with your questions and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Insights on Demand event. Okay.